Welcome to today's webinar or virtual panel on, on SFTR. It's been a while since, since our last open event on, on SFTR um, and two months into the actual reporting go live uh, felt like a good moment for a discussion uh, on, on some of the lessons learned, um, also in view, of course, of the uh, upcoming buy side go live. So really good uh, to see the level of interest uh, in the event today. Um, I'm Alex Westphal, a director here at, uh, at ICMA and secretary to uh, our European Repo and uh, Collateral Council. And in that role, I also coordinate our SFTR work and more specifically, uh, of course, our SFTR task force. So it's a pleasure to, to mo moderate today's uh, webinar. I'll be joined in a, in a moment by our guests uh, for, the, for the panel discussion. But before leaving the floor uh, to the panelists, um, I wanted to give a very brief uh, introduction, just a little bit of background uh, covering the SFTR timeline and also to explain um, a little bit uh, what we've been doing at ICMA over the past uh, years to help members with this uh, no doubt very challenging implementation process. So I'll run through uh, a few slides, um, which we'll also uh, send around afterwards. Um, I included all the relevant links and, uh, and contact details, so please do feel free to, to follow up uh, after the event. Okay, starting here with the, with the high-level SFTR timeline, um, just to see where we're coming from. Uh, I won't go through this in detail, but uh, just to show that it has been indeed a long and winding road. Uh, six and a half years from the initial proposal back in uh, 2014 until the, the 13th of July this year, when we saw the, the start of, of SFTR reporting, at least for, for firms in the first uh, two phases. Um, so that's the banks and investment firms, but also uh, CCPs and, uh, and CSDs. That was, of course, three months later than, than initially planned, um, thanks to the delay granted by ESMA back in March. Um, of course, very welcome and, and much needed relief um, in the quite uh, extraordinary circumstances this year. But this is not the end of the road. There is more to come. Uh, we have two remaining phases that we'll uh, need to start reporting still. Uh, we, have, we will see the buy side on the 13th of October um, start. Um, so that's less than a month away. And we'll, of course, uh, speak about that uh, later. And also non-financial counterparties who will start in January next year. Um, except, and that's important to note, uh, in the UK where NFCs uh, won't need to report at all as was clarified a few weeks ago by the UK government. And that brings me to the next inevitable point on the slide, uh, Brexit, or rather the end of the transition period um, at the end of this year. Still quite a few questions open um, and uh, we'll certainly touch on that later in the panel as well. Um, but what we can definitely say is that uh, this will split SFTR um, into two separate reporting regimes, uh, the UK SFTR and the EU SFTR. Also a few words on, uh, on ESMA's level three guidance um, that covers a, a number of uh, very important documents. We've seen uh, the publication of the final reporting guidelines uh, on the 6th of January. Um, they were published alongside um, an updated version of the equally important uh, validation rules and also the ISO 20022 XML schemas. Um, those were published already in, in December last year. Um, in addition to, to, to what we've already uh, seen, uh, we also expect ESMA to publish some Q&As um, with some additional clarifications, although the timing on that is uh, still to be, uh, to be confirmed. And also important to mention that there are a number of issues uh, still with both the validation rules and the schemas. Uh, so those will definitely have to be updated and corrected as well. Um, and uh, that's also, the timing on that is also still um, to be confirmed. 
Also a few more specific uh, guidelines on, on, on some issues. Um, we've seen a recent consultation uh, by ESMA on some draft guidelines for the calculation of SFT positions by trade repositories um, that closed this week and uh, we submitted a response. So that's another thing to be finalized still. And ultimately, uh, also just wanted to mention for completeness as with uh, most EU laws, uh, there's a formal uh, review process foreseen in the level one text um, that was, will kick off already with an initial ESMA report um, as early as April next year. I also need to say, of course, a few words about our SFTR work here at ICMA. Um, and I'm sure that uh, many of you are, in fact, uh, already aware and quite familiar with it. Um, so SFDR has obviously been a very important focus for our um, European Repo and Collateral Council over the past years. Um, we've been involved uh, since the very beginning of the, of the process um, and created a, a dedicated task force on, on SFDR in, in 2017. Uh, that group has changed quite significantly since then. Uh, and has turned into, into really ICMA's largest uh, active working group. Uh, we now have around 700 individuals on the group from, from over 150 firms. Um, and we generally hold weekly or bi-weekly meetings. So, so very active group. And also important to note that um, we've kept this group intentionally very open um, from the beginning to, to try and cover really the full range of market participants and ensure uh, broad, broad input and broad representation. So that's not only sell side and buy side, but also the main market infrastructures, TRs, um, and also other, other service providers. So generally that has been really positive um, to have that, that, that level of, uh, of input. Um, and of course, especially important as the key focus for us and for this group is um, to agree uh, and document detailed best practice recommendations uh, to complement basically the, the official guidance and, and fill um, any remaining gaps. So very important for that to have a broad consensus, of course. And uh, indeed, we haven't been uh, lazy and produced quite a lot of material over the years. Um, a few key documents um, to highlight, and they are listed here. Uh, most importantly, of course, uh, our ICMA recommendations for reporting under SFTR. Um, that has become a very substantial document now, quite difficult uh, to uh, catch up with it. The fourth version uh, was released on 7th of uh, September, now uh, nearly 300 pages long. Um, and that continues to evolve. And, uh, and sorry to say, also to further grow. Alongside the, the recommendations, we also produced a number of uh, complementary best practice documents, um, including our SFTR sample reports, which now cover uh, around uh, 50 repo scenarios, um, an overview of life cycle events, um, and something to mention more recently, uh, since the go live, we also have uh, been busy uh, collecting feedback from members and have put together a list uh, of nearly 50 uh, concrete reporting issues that uh, problems that, that firms are, are still grappling with. Um, so that's something that some of these issues at least will certainly discuss later. And finally, uh, just also to note our aggregated uh, SFTR public data, which we've been publishing on a weekly basis since the, since the go live, uh, based of course on the data published by the four TRs. Okay, that's, uh, that's it for my, for my short introduction. Uh, let's uh, get the panel started and welcome our guests today. Uh, all of them very active, participants in, in our SFTR task force. Almost feels a little bit like, uh, like a smaller version of our uh, regular task force meetings today with slightly extended audience. Um, so let me, let me introduce, um, first of all, Craig Laird, um, Executive Director at Morgan Stanley and importantly, Chair of our SFTR task force. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, Richard Komoto, uh, who's a senior advisor for the ICMA, 
um, and as many of you uh, will know, very central to our SFTR work uh, as Richard is holding the pen on, on all the best practices. And also very happy to welcome uh, two other key members of the task force, uh, James Stacy, a regulatory business analyst at, at LCH, uh, who will cover the CCP perspective today, and Catherine Talks, uh, product manager at Univista, one of the four TRs um, authorized under and active under, under um, SFTR. So I think that gives us a very good, uh, good mix um, and a good basis for an interesting discussion today. Uh, so let's jump straight in uh, with the questions and let's start with, with the obvious question. Um, so we're now two months into the reporting uh, feedback we've heard so far has generally been really positive, uh, especially of course, compared to previous experiences. Um, so would you, would you all agree with this optimistic mood or are there any dark spots and, and, and also what are the, what are the, what do you see as the key reasons um, why this has been more positive than, than previously? Should we start with Craig? Yeah, sure, Alex. Um, I guess contrary as it is to my natural personality, yeah, I think the optimism is probably quite well placed. You know, I think um, you, you touched on it there, but I definitely agree relative to previous transaction reporting implementations, um, you know, EMEA or Method and, and ones outside of Europe, SFTR has gone remarkably well. I think if you layer on top of that, the, the sheer volume of data inherent to an SFTR report and the level, I guess, the kind of unprecedented levels in terms of external dependencies, which firms have to absorb into the reporting flows and workflows, I think the outcome of SFTR has been um, absolutely tremendous to this point. Uh, sure, there are, there are still teething issues. There are things which we and a whole number of firms across the street are still working through in terms of minor issues, which we'll come on to discuss. But I think overarchingly, this has been a, a, a hugely positive go live to this point. Good to hear. Do I disagree, James, from a CCP perspective? Has it been similar? Yeah, absolutely. I, I echo everything. Uh, Craig says. Um, I think what I'd add to that is I think it's testament to the amount of work, the sheer volume and detail of work that um, groups like the SFTR task force put in um, to put together the best practice document um, to make sure that kind of everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. Uh, there were a lot of challenges, uh, even in the you know, weeks up to the original go live date, which as, as you mentioned, Alex was pushed back uh, due to unprecedented circumstances. But I think broadly speaking, the fact that the majority of participants would have been ready uh, to report on that day one go live uh, and the fact that, you know, acceptance rates, which I'm sure Catherine will go into in a minute um, of the uh, reporting that's been made to date have been so high just shows how kind of seriously everyone took this, how everyone's kind of learned lessons from uh, previous uh, reporting regimes and kind of put in the homework to make sure this went as smoothly as possible. Catherine, James already mentioned you. So I would echo everything that's been said before. It has been a very good low, a very good go live. We've seen a very high acceptance rate. What that means is all of, between all of the reports that have been sent to the repository, a considerable number is passing all of the validations and there's four levels of validations. So that's not a small feat. Um, we've actually seen rates that have been in the very high 90s all the way since go live. So it is just a testament to how well firms are working and the level of engagement that they've had. I think the postponement that James referred to has been really very beneficial. It gave firms a lot more time for testing and actually making sure that they had all of the procedures in place, that they were running through all of their different flows to make sure that they could test all their scenarios at the repository. We have seen that you know people are following the best practices um, and I definitely think a lot of it comes down to the work and the engagement from the industry and with the industry bodies that's really helped um, get firms ready for their reporting go live. Okay, thanks. Um, Richard, I'm sure you have some downsides to mention, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to those anyway later on. Um, perhaps before doing that, um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, since the GoLab, we've been uh, aggregating the, the, the public data published by the TRs um, 
on a weekly basis and made that available on the on the ICMA website. And Richard, you've been you've played an instrumental role uh, in that together with my colleague John. So Richard, can you can you perhaps just give us an, an overview uh, on on that data? How how meaningful has that been so far? And are there already any any kind of interesting takeaways from that? Yeah, um, thanks, Alex. So uh, one general point to make at the beginning is uh, there really isn't enough data. There's a very limited um, feedback to the market, and one would hope that um, more information uh, would be given in due course. So, so really, um, there's enough to make it interesting, but probably not enough to make it useful. Um, second point, I think, is uh, people commented that the volumes were sort of lower than expected. Um, I'll talk about that in the, particular, in the context of repo later. Um, so that was a, perhaps a bit of a surprise and um, it might you know, affect the economics of, of, of being a TR, but we'll, we'll see in due course. Um, looking at the data itself, I think you have to ignore week one. Uh, as with most new reporting regimes, week one is always a bit dodgy and it's clear from the data that uh, we, we'll scrub that out of the way. So we'll just look at weeks two to nine. Um, you can't unfortunately get much out of the collateral side. There are some problems there um, that, that have yet to settle down. But on the loan side, uh, the numbers are, look quite stable. So um, that, that's very encouraging. Uh, margin lending, I should mention, is tiny and um, hardly seems worth bothering about, so about two billion a week. Um, but to get to the main event, which is repo, in many ways, the numbers confirm what we already knew. So the average um, over weeks two to nine for the outstanding size of the repo market uh, come to about 9.4 trillion euros. And um, the December 2019 ICMA survey um, came out at about 8.3 trillion. Now there are big differences in coverage, but you know a lot of them offset each other. Uh, but what we can say is that the numbers are in the right ballpark. So clearly, um, you know, well, well, obviously we're happy from the point of view of producing the ICMA survey, but also I think it confirms that you know, SFTR is broadly speaking producing sensible numbers on the loan side. Some other stuff you can draw, um, CCPs account for about 43% of outstanding uh, business on in SFTR. The ICMA survey put it about 30, but again, you know, the, the samples are different. We can't really make much use of information about trading venues and execution venues. The, the definitions are so different. Um, but one number we do have, which we really didn't have before, is turnover. And in repo, it's about 3.2 trillion a day. Um, so, uh, and about 95,000 transactions a day. So that's something quite new. So um, yeah, you know, um, good start. I hope the collateral problems can be sorted out, but you know, let's have more data back to the market. Okay, thanks, Richard. No, that was actually uh, already really uh, interesting. Um, coming on then to uh, the now quite immediate future, um, with the buy side uh, go live uh, less than a month uh, away. Um, so what, what, what do you see as some of the key lessons um, for firms that are about to start reporting from these first two months? Anything that uh, they should have to focus on, particularly in this, in this last phase, uh, run up to the go live? So yeah, so like, I'll, I'll touch on just a couple of a, a few points here, and um, I'll be very brief on each one, so as to, to not take up too much time. I think a lot of these can probably be derived from the intro, which you've already had, but I think one of the key things which can't go understated is um, effective UTI understanding and UTI communication um, between counterparties. Clearly, the, the rules define the direction for which the UTI should be generated and shared. Um, however, the, the sort of first principle of that decision tree is to bilaterally agree with your counterparties. So I think it's incumbent on more or less every firm on the street to understand when you face any individual counterparty what what your plan is for sharing the UTI. So who's going to be the generator, who's going to be the consumer, and importantly, how are you going to share it? Is that going to be something done by a chat? Is it going to be something using one of the um, vendor platforms, for instance? So I think having transparency and clarity around that is critical. Um, second point, just briefly, you've already touched on that. I think best practice and understanding what the industry best practice is and aligning to that as best as possible. You know, as we have all borne the scars, there's, you know, 18 months, 20 months worth of discussion around 
things which were reasonably contentious, booking practices which needed to be aligned, etc. So there are a, a lot of um, areas where it really serves high value to read that to understand what the, the general thinking was. And of course, the document contains not just the, the conclusion, but also you know how we got to that conclusion and what the sort of various arguments were. I think just again, even more briefly, understanding your operating model, ensuring that when it comes to pairing and matching and the, and the inevitable pairing and matching breaks that are going to arise, understanding what the resolution path within your organization looks like and making sure importantly that you distinguish between you know existing affirmation and matching platforms versus your transaction reporting output and then lastly just something which Catherine touched on briefly and i think it's something which the industry had generally done reasonably well as part of sftr and, and hopefully that's going to be the same for phase three but you know with the best well in the world all this sort of intellectual preparation for this doesn't prepare quite as much as just doing volume like testing so you know getting testing as early as possible both with your transaction or trade repository sorry any vendors and importantly with your counterparties as well catherine anything to add from a tr perspective yeah i think um i think craig's covered a lot of the items that firms should really be aware of it's important to make sure that you know go, that whilst you're in the project stage that any resources that you've got you know who's going to be taking this in BAU that your resources are adequately trained that you know what this is going to look like one of the things that we generally see a lot more in this particular phase of reporting is delegation so whilst you can delegate the action of reporting you can't delegate your obligations you need to make sure that you have the right operational processes to take in all of that data reported on your behalf and reconcile it and if you are going to outsource and you are going to delegate, um, making sure that you know how you're going to account for the reuse calculation, if you use one person to do it, if you're going to be doing it directly yourself, these are all questions that you need to make sure that you know the answer to um, prior to undertaking that reporting. Very much as Craig said, the UTI generation and dissemination has been something that's created some issues. We're actually seeing queries from firms that haven't had the UTI disseminated in a timely manner and they haven't bilaterally agreed a fallback process. Um, so they start raising questions around how do I report it? UTI is mandatory. Um, so it's really important to make sure that that outreach is done and that you know the operational processes that you're going to be undertaking in a production environment. One of the other items that will affect the buy side considerably is the explicit permission requirement. So I try and mention it in everything so that everyone's very aware. Um, but it's actually a requirement to make sure if you are submitting data on behalf of an entity that isn't within your own direct organisational structure, that you have the permission to do that. The buy side fund managers who will be reporting on behalf of funds that aren't own funds are going to need to make sure they have all of those permissions in place. And especially if there are thousands of funds under management, that can be a sizable process. So you really need to make sure that you're doing that outreach, that you have everything in place to be able to begin reporting at a trade repository. And finally, I think one of the key things that you know, we've touched on now is testing. It really is important to make sure that you're testing all of your scenarios, you're testing your processes, that you, know, you understand the outputs, you're following the best practice and you know the reports that you're sending so that you can go through that reporting and through the reconciliation process because it's not only your side of the report it's how your counterpart is reporting to okay thanks catherine richard i saw uh, recently a interesting slide of you where you uh, tried to uh, put together some some lessons as well is there anything that craig and catherine didn't touch on no, I mean, to, to some extent, to echo what they've said, um, I, I would say that a, a key guiding principle, but unfortunately not 100% um, applicable, is um, follow the contractual reality. And the, the challenge there might be to actually understand what the contract is. So in our discussions on SFTR, we, we've been quite, it's been quite interesting to discover that uh, people have been uncertain over the precise nature of, of what they've agreed. Uh, and this means getting a legal input um, being clear ab about the contract. So how the contract, how the transaction appears operationally will be very different in many cases from how uh, it is actually constructed legally. And, um, you know, we have numerous examples of that where firms have uh, conducted, li or rather life cycle events have been represented operationally by closing the transaction and reopening, but that's not what's happening legally. And that can obviously lead to, to breaks between uh, firms using different approaches. And then um, I think that if you just read 
the official documents, the level ones, the level twos, the guidance, you know, the, uh, and so on, you would struggle to implement SFTR. So I'm going to echo again what everybody said. You really do need to read the industry recommendations because there's a lot of soft guidance that's come through. There's a lot of guidance that we've evolved to help by consensus. Um, I, I just really feel um, sorry for anybody who's perhaps had the level one and two and the guidelines and validation rules dumped on their desk and said, well, this is what it's all about. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. <laughs> Okay, perhaps there's a quick follow up, um, and that's probably mainly to to Craig and uh, and Catherine. Um, what's your impression from, from talking to to clients, um, counterparts? Uh, how how does it look in terms of you know readiness, buy side readiness? Uh, do we have reasons to to be worried? Um, I, th I think it kind of reflects how we looked pre the go live of well, phase one and phase two as they were merged. Um, there's clearly a, a, a quite a split. Um, it seems that there are some people who are perhaps not quite as far up the curve quite yet. It seems that there are people who are pretty advanced, um, and indeed there are some who are extremely uh, extremely advanced and have been um, more or less in a ready state for some months now. So uh, there are encouraging signs. There are some where perhaps they just, as I say, need to come up the curve a little bit more. I think if I if I look at uh, uh, you know our client readiness metrics you know there are still some clients with whom we are kind of struggling to close out what exactly the approach is going to be which it kind of makes us a little bit blind to what the readiness looks like so really just to sort of reiterate the point which i made um in terms of lessons for the buy side that, that communication with your prospective counterparties and understanding how you're going to report and share your ti etc is, is really really important so if there are kind of key brokers whom you're dealing with from the buy side that who you have not yet kind of engaged with to understand what that looks like then i would strongly suggest um, that you know the, the clock is ticking and, and it'd be good to get on the front foot with that regard Catherine, what's what's your impression so I think, um, much like Craig said, we, we do have a split. We have the firms that are very ready, who have been ready for quite some time and who are very advanced in their testing stages. Um, we also have some firms that are just engaging and still going through the selection process. So there is quite a variation in, in the readiness of firms. We have noticed that our UAT testing volumes are increasing. So firms that have signed up that are in the testing processes are definitely starting to increase the volume of reports that they're putting through UAT, which is a very good sign. Um, one of the things that we will be doing is like reconciling against all the firms we feel should be reporting um, and making sure that they are all testing um, because it is really quite key to make sure that you, know, you do choose a repository and that you are testing. SFTR has been really unique. So we've generally seen firms have been um, vendor selecting or choosing who they're going to report through selecting delegated agents um, much earlier on in the cycle. And then the repository is kind of more of an endpoint. But again, you really do need to make sure that if you are delegating, that you have everything in place to perform those reconciliations because ultimately it's still your obligation. Um, and if you, are, if you have selected a vendor, but not yet a repository, you really do need to select a repository and start getting testing because there isn't a, a lot of time now until the go live. Okay, thanks. Um, and perhaps on, on it's also a good moment to reiterate that even if it's very late in the day, it's not too late to join our SFTR task force if you're not, not yet on it. So please uh, do get in touch. Uh, I hope most of, most of uh, the firms are already on it or of course in, in another um, association. Uh, we know that uh, some of the buy side associations are also closely looking at, uh, at SFTR and we're working closely together with them, the IA in the UK or a farmer, but, um, but clearly uh, there's a need to be fully linked up. So um, please do get in touch, even if it's only for uh, being linked in, uh, looped in for the, for the information flow. Okay, moving back, moving back actually a little bit uh, to uh, the first two months of, um, of reporting. So we've heard of course, uh, that the overall impression was very, very positive. Um, but there are, uh, as we know, uh, quite a number of, uh, of issues still to sort out. And I mentioned the, um, the ICMA issues log uh, in the introduction. Um, it's a fairly long list. So we have uh, nearly 50 issues uh, 
listed, um, but focusing only perhaps on the on the top issues. Um, and if you could uh, each limit yourself to the let's say two top top problems um, that you're grappling with, uh, what would those be? James, perhaps we can we can start with you. Sure. So um, I think Richard touched on it briefly earlier, but there is a kind of fundamental problem with the way that collateral um, is reconciled. And I'll, I'll give a kind of very high, high level explanation of what this is. If you are the giver of collateral, you report it as a negative sign. And if you are the taker of collateral, you report it as a positive. However, um, for some reason, when these negative and positive figures go through to the trade repositories, they are converted into absolute values. So negatives become positives. And the reconciliation rule states that a negative must reconcile with a positive. So somewhere between the reporting and the reconciliation, uh, the collateral fields cease to become reconcilable, not through any um, fault of those reporting who, according to the guidelines, are doing everything as they should, but really just because of a kind of breakdown in the, uh, in, in the process flow in the schemas from kind of A to B. Um, so that, that collateral signage problem uh, means that every time you report a trade with any collateral on it, you essentially get three breaks per trade that you report. And for an institution like LCH, um, that starts to become a problem when we try to digest our break reports, because if you think about the volume that goes through the CCP, um, every one of those trades is going to break three times minimum. So not even looking at any of the tri-party uh, collateral statements as well that, that we have to try and reconcile. And that makes it very difficult to kind of see the wood for the trees when it comes to break reports. Um, Excel has an upper limit of just shy of 1.1 million rows. And we are already seeing more breaks than Excel can handle. Um, so that, that's a problem. I think it's a known problem. I, I, I believe it's been raised at, at various TR forums in the past. Um, so, you know, we are very keen to, to push for that problem to be resolved um, so that we can, as I said, start, start um, being able to digest really where our breaks are. I think the other kind of major uh, thing for, for everyone who's about to start reporting in SFTR mm. should concern themselves mm. with mm. is um, static data or bond uh, reference data. There are a lot of new data points that firms need to start reporting when it comes to the collateral underpinning any, any trade, uh, not limited to um, the LEI of the issuer, the CFI code, the collateral quality, various other things as well. And not only is there a lot of data that, that has to be reported there, but obviously that's gonna, that, that may well come at a cost depending on what your uh, static data uh, contracts are like with your data vendors. So you know, I would encourage anyone who is uh, looking to start reporting an SFTR to really look at their, at their static data, make sure it's up to scratch, make sure it's in place and everything's feeding through appropriately. Um, especially when it comes to things like new issues, which you know can can pop up intraday, but may or may not come through in those uh, in those live feeds, um, and also just kind of be aware that that there is that potential cost around the corner as well. Thanks, thanks, James. Catherine, from a TR perspective, the top so two think, issues. I think there are a number of issues that we're seeing. I'm sort of focusing more on the things that are stopping the acceptance criteria. Um, and one of those has definitely been a maturity date issue that we've found. So up to one day, and that's one actual day, one, one working day following the submission of a maturity. So after you submit a maturity date on a report, if you are one day past the maturity date that you've given, which is one business day past the maturity date of the report, up to that point, you can amend the maturity date. But if you're any further along than that, so you notice that the maturity date is wrong a week later, there is no way to correct that report. That report is now closed and the action cannot be removed from a closed date. Um, and that means that firms who have had settlement failures and certain problems in their reports, they just can't go back and correct those reports or amend the maturity dates, which is leading to some issues that we've seen with firms um, who are saying, you know, they, they really do need to go back and correct it, but they can't reopen the trade. So it means a new trade with a UTI to replace that um, and potentially erroring out the original report. So there is some complexity that's really arising from that rule. 
um, it's in the guidelines, so um, it, it's something that you know firms should definitely investigate and be aware of. Um, as well as that, we've had problems with the early termination date, very much an associated problem. Once you send down an e-term, it can't be amended or corrected. Um, so if you send down an e-term in error, then the only way to revoke it is to send an error report and start again with a new UTI. And that again has caused some issues. So the maturity termination date is definitely one of the um, persisting issues that we've seen firms um, discussing with us. One of the other things that we've seen is around colleague reports on action type sequencing. Um, but the action type sequencing is really affecting colleague reports. Um, so because backloading um, firms aren't, aren't reporting backloaded trades anymore, we're seeing colleague reports with no mute, um, which breaks the action type sequencing logic. So there were, there were a number of rejections that were happening for that reason. So if you haven't sent a report, you haven't sent a trade with a UTI, you can't send UTI-based collateral. Um, because if the first action is a collateral receipt, then that will be rejected by the trade repository. It breaks the rules. In the guidelines, there is an action type sequencing table. So it's really important to make sure you follow that table. If you are sending a maturity and then trying to um, correct that maturity date, for instance, that breaks the action type sequencing as well. So you need to make sure that you are looking at what you're reporting, making sure that you report action types that adhere to the, to the logical format that has to be accepted by the repository. Okay, thanks Catherine. And uh, coming on to Craig, um, sure these other issues are also all, uh, you share them, but what are two more? I think you need to unmute you. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep this brief. I, th I think if I look across the full spectrum of SFTR where we stand today, I, I would say unquestionably the biggest challenge we have is in the agent lending flow, um, just because of the dependency we have on external data and a lot of the action type stuff which has been fit into it. Um, having said that, you know, I think the agent lenders have done a remarkable job getting to where we, where we have got to since phase one and two. So I think that's the biggest problem, but given that this is very much a, a repo forum, looking kind of beyond that, I've touched on it in terms of lessons, I've touched on it in terms of communication with clients, but I think one of the biggest challenges we're seeing, again, relate to UTI, and, and more specifically where effectively the way in which we are handling life cycle events and booking processes results in a different treatment of LAIs, such as a, a role, for instance, being kind of extended as the same, um, the same UTI versus uh, being kind of closed out and, and booked as a new UTI. We've seen instances where counterparties or clients sending through errors on UTIs, which we hadn't necessarily expected. Um, and obviously, if you error out a UTI, then it means fundamentally that both sides of the trade, that UTI is now dead forevermore. So you need to kind of reverse out your own and, and replace. And um, so that and kind of aligning the UTI logic with um, appropriate lifecycle events and booking models is, is, is really critical. Um, just taking another point, which, which James alluded to, but I'll just kind of double down on it a little bit just because we've seen some issues on this actually very recently. Um, with regards to the LAI of issue, and this, this is kind of a, 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 a kind of spectre overhanging the goal live of SFTR for some time. And um, for those who have been close to it, ESMA came along and gave us 12 months forbearance around non-EU markets, meaning we didn't necessarily have to have an LAI of issue for, um, for non-EU securities. Nevertheless, we have seen some breaks where a particular stock, we've actually seen a number of instances where it's a, a, a European listing of a US stock, which has is, is, is ended up not having appropriate LA this year. And I think just so that people are aware really on this call, if you're not going live so far, one of the big risks inherent to this is, you know, you can have a portfolio or a basket of billions of dollars worth of collateral and effectively have one security position size is tens of thousands of dollars, and yet that one security's absence of an LAI renders the entire thing rejected. Um, and you can therefore end up with significant under-reports on the basis of one security having this gap. So whilst people have heard me harping on about this ad nauseum for 18 months now, you know, I think we've got to a point where, yes, we're a lot healthier than we should be, or, or than we looked like we were going to be. Um, but with the April deadline coming along where other non-European markets are going to be introduced to this, I think we really need to seriously consider how we manage that when it becomes a lot more prevalent. Thanks, Craig. Um, Richard, then over to you to sweep up. Is it, uh, I mean, obviously there are lots more issues on the list. What are, what are kind of the two major yeah, ones that we haven't mentioned yet? There is so much to choose from, Alex. Um, so I picked two, which in some ways are typical of, of problems with other fields. Well, um, 
One is this strange field called value date of collateral, um, which isn't in fact the value date of the collateral at all. Now this field uh, was introduced originally um, uh, to cover the situation where collateral was pre-deposited, uh, prepaid for securities loans. And the idea was that um, if you had a portfolio of loans um, coming on board, but you place the, uh, the collateral down first, you would identify those loans by giving the value date of the latest loan, the last value date in that portfolio. And I suppose it probably did that, although I, I you know, just indicated that this collateral wasn't over collateralization, it was in anticipation of something else, uh, a loan coming on board. And then um, the field was extended to repo. Um, and the problem here is it just doesn't work at all. So uh, you've got an issue like forward repo, something which regulators really didn't know existed, but which counts up to 20% of the market. Um, so, you know, you, you've got this field which is going to be confused by the fact there are all sorts of future value dates out there, not just um, collateral given in advance. And in any case, in repo, you don't place collateral in advance. It's a sale, it has to be the same time. So this created all sorts of problems. Uh, ESMA um, commendably decided they'd remove it but they only removed it from new reports. And you know that's great, but the problem is now, if somebody corrects a new report, um, you've got to put the value date of collateral in the correction. And the correction overwrites your new report, so it reinserts this value date in there. But of course your counterparty, there's no value date in his report, and these are matching fields, so you get a mismatch. Uh, so it's an unintended consequence. And I'm afraid there's an example of where fields have been pushed around to different uses um, and all this tinkering is really just led to problems. The second field will be uh, collateral market value. Now this is going to cause real problems from April of 2022 but people have got to grapple with it now to try and sort it out. So when somebody does a, a deal um, they agree on the value of the collateral with the counterparty but it doesn't actually mean that internally they agree on that value. You have to agree on something with the counterparty to get the deal done. But when that deal goes into your internal systems, then they may value it differently. There will be an enterprise wide price that's used to value the collateral. And there'll be a difference. What Esmer is saying is that that collateral market value must come from your internal systems. And there is a suggestion that if there's a difference between what you've agreed with your party to get the deal done and what is being used as an enterprise wide valuation price internally, if there's a difference, you should go back and correct the enterprise wide price. Now, this thing has been put together by a risk control unit with all sorts of validation procedures for global use by a firm. This is very much the reporting tail wagging the risk management dog. And I'm afraid, you know, there's a um, well, there's an irreducible logic, illogicality here that we've got to deal with. That, so we've got to start matching from April 2022. There's a lot of work to be done to solve this problem. Okay. Thanks, Richard. No, I think, that, and, and everyone, I think that gives us a, a nice selection. And of course, uh, you know, given the very positive uh, outline we come from in the beginning with the first question is, uh, uh, calms it down a little bit the optimism but but still we, we continue to evolve this list of course and, and perhaps also important to mention that um, we shared this list of of, um, of reporting issues with ESMA already um, and with uh, with a few uh, NCAs and we continue to also uh, do that in the future um, with an updated version and perhaps the last point I think it, it came already through uh, in your description but what we do distinguish in that this is also those issues that are kind of inherent in the rules uh, versus those issues where firms are just not um, not following um, existing best practice or existing rules uh, appropriately. I think those are two quite, uh, it, it's quite an important distinction, especially from the point of view of regulators, of course, and ESMA. Um, and of course, what we will also do and uh, continue to, to do is to um, draw the relevant uh, lessons for our um, best practice recommendations and, and uh, update them uh, as much as possible to, to kind of uh, address the, the, the topics, the, the issues that we identified in this list. So Richard, on that note, do you just want to give us a quick um, update on the ICMA recommendations and, and how that's uh, 
uh, going to continue and, and what the process is? I think we'll, you know, you mentioned that we're already um, at 300 pages and it's quite a difficult document to, um, certainly not bedtime reading. Um, and what we found is as the recommendations expand, um, we have a lot of overlaps between individual recommendations. So a process of consolidation is taking place where we'll pick an issue which has been mentioned in several recommendations and we'll bring it all together. So for example, um, the sequencing of action types that Catherine mentioned, um, we have a new recommendation there to try and consolidate um, guidance on that. Um, I think then eventually when SFTR stabilizes, so possibly sometime in the next century, um, we will um, probably get rid of the historical narrative. Craig mentioned this. It's important at the moment to have that in there because we have people coming in at different stages and um, they often raise the question, well, you know, why, why was that agreed? What, you know, what was the history to that discussion? So at the moment, we provide a bit of a historical narrative to each of our recommendations. Um, but I think once um, SFTR does um, bed down, we'll be able to strip that away. So hopefully shrink the recommendations to uh, something a bit more, more easily usable. Okay. Thanks, Richard. We can also cover a um, couple of uh, further quite problematic areas, a uh, little bit the elephant in the room um, that are still causing quite massive problems for firms in terms of implementation and, and also quite a lot of discussion in, in our um, SFTR task force. And I'm thinking here mainly of one topic, which is the reporting of uh, settlement fails. Um, we sent numerous queries that wasn't clear in the in the guidelines. Um, so we sent uh, numerous queries to, to ESMA on that topic and, 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 and feedback. Um, we struggled, struggled quite a lot to get a response, um, but we received uh, some guidance, uh, informal guidance, um, just quite close to the to the go live. I think it was in probably in March or April. Um, where ESMA unfortunately uh, insisted that they want firms to reflect settlement fails on the repo repurchase lag uh, in their reporting. Um, we've always been very clear to ESMA and also to the NCAs that, that this would be hugely problematic um, in terms of implementation and, and would also, um, given that it's so complex to implement, would, um, would require uh, firms months worth of work, um, which obviously couldn't be done uh, in time for the for the go live. Um, James, do you perhaps from a CCP perspective, because that's a quite a specific angle, you, you have a, a, your particular problems with this uh, approach. Do you mind just explaining perhaps what, uh, what the problem is on your side from a CCP perspective? Sure thing. So, so I think there's, there's kind of two angles to this. Firstly, um, you know, we feel that it, it fundamentally diverges uh, risk systems from reporting systems. Um, you know, if, if, a, if a repo end leg fails, one does not go into the booking system and, and change the, the, the termination date. Um, to do so would be to um, also increase the end leg cash or decrease it, depending on which side of the trade you're on, um, because repos are booked at a rate. So adding an extra day will change the uh, cash that has accumulated. So that's kind of one part of it. The other part of it is um, one of the kind of key benefits that, that comes from clearing trades through a CCP is that we net all of our instructions on a payment and settlement level. Um, we net not only uh, repos and reverse repos, start legs with end legs, but also outright cash purchases and sales. So that means any one specific settlement instruction which fails can be made up of myriad um, uh, start, end, buy, sell, different um, uh, contract types, different directions, uh, etc. So if, if one of those instructions fails, it's kind of near impossible to determine, okay, it's specifically X, Y, Z end legs, which have caused that fail or which are technically failing because within that netted settlement bucket, um, you could argue that all of the end legs have fundamentally netted with all of the uh, cash purchases and cash sales, and so therefore could be deemed as, as settled. Um, 
the 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 kind of um, the intricacies of of stripping that apart um, would in in kind of extreme circumstances mean that we would have to effectively break up all of that settlement netting thereby reducing collateral volatility across the system and introducing a, quite a lot of systematic risk so we fed back to our ncas that that we don't feel this is possible um, let alone um, um, kind of prudent or, or probable um, so that's that's i guess the the 40, foot view of, of why we think that's a problem thanks james and anything to add on that richard craig just to say, well, certainly the point about bifurcating risk systems from reporting systems is a, is a really serious issue because one of the principles of SFTR we've been told is that reporting should reflect books and records. Uh, but I would add to that, um, we've always used this principle of follow contractual reality and this is breaking that principle. Um, you are not um, extending the maturity of the contract. Um, so I think there's a false picture being presented um, which has um, dangerous ramifications. Yeah, Alex, I mean, nothing, nothing more to add to the guys. All I would say is, you know, from an implementation standpoint, you know, one of the big challenges I'm sure we've been realised is since we've gone live, we've got all sorts of pairing and matching issues and other things which have caused problems to try and resolve and get on top of. So getting to the point where this work, which you touched on, is, is sizable, but getting that work scheduled and having the resources to do it when you're still trying to fight the fires of the ongoing production environment is, you know, we're, we're not talking about a small piece of work to change your um, systems to report a, a kind of shifting and creeping end date. Mm. Indeed, that's still something we're grappling with and where we hope to also perhaps have another um, discussion with with Esma on that on that question okay we can then move on to the to the questions uh, from the audience I have one final question as well for for the panel but perhaps we can first uh, see if there's anything that came in from uh, from participants John yeah definitely some valuable insight into the obs observations and lesson learned um, from the SFTR go live we, we do actually have a couple of questions here uh, I think quite a few are interested in what will happen after Brexit. So we have our first question about after Brexit, um, what changes do you expect FCA to implement over time? And are, you, are there anything that you think as FCA would do immediately to simplify the regime quickly? The poisonous question, who wants to take it? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start with, um... I, th I think we'll all probably have a reasonably similar answer. I, like, I, I think it's very difficult to say. I, I'm not sure that the FCA will do anything in the short term that changes from what uh, ESMA have implemented. You know, I, I, th I think that uh, would be difficult. I think from an implementation standpoint, it, if, if there's a change impacting one NCA, this, it, that means effectively you have a bifurcated bill between an, an FCA solution versus a European solution. Then I think that from an implementation standpoint actually introduces complexity, even if the overarching aim is to reduce complexity on the FCA side. So I, I think, for, firstly, I, I think to, for changes to come in post Brexit, um, you know, when we're still relatively uh, immature in the regime would be, would be difficult, um, but I don't, I don't suspect there'll be anything material, certainly in the short term. Craig, can I ask you a question? Has the, has the exemption uh, from reporting NFCs caused you a complication? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> to be honest, to be honest, I mean, coming back to my earlier point, until you mentioned it, I kind of forgot about it. So it's, uh, it's something that we'll need to look at in our bill. But no, it's not, it's not something which we, it's not something which we have, uh, I guess, we consider it to be a particular additional complexity. It's it's good, I guess, that we have a smaller reporting population who are required to, but it, ultimately from our side, we would still be reporting our side of the trade anyway, irrespective of whether the counterparty is. It just reduces the pairing and matching burden on a small number of trades. Yeah. Sorry, that was an ambush. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so from my perspective, SFTR is quite unique um, because there's not only a reporting obligation for the firm, there's this branch reporting obligation. So you need to look very carefully at not only yourself and where you feel you are reportable as an entity, but where the branches are reportable. And you might well find that you have a reporting obligation for one execution, both under UK law and under European law. 
And then if you're delegating, it adds additional complexity. If you're reporting in one jurisdiction, but your delegatee is reporting or reportable to a different jurisdiction. So there are a lot of different permutations that Brexit will bring in that firms will need to consider as part of their program of work for Brexit. Um, can I say one thing I hope that might change is that um, the requirement to report central bank um, uh, SFTs under MIFIA might possibly be dumped, but who's, who knows? Great, great. Thank you. Um, just another follow-up question on that. Do you think the separate reporting regimes with, um, with the Brexit, obviously, will under undermine the regulation for SFTs between entities that are in two different regimes? For example, if there's no entity or reconciliation across the two, um, and SFT legs become single-sided. So does that really putting down the power of the regulation while apply to do a sided reporting? No. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't think it undermines it per se, yet clearly the obligation of SFTR and the intention of SFTR was dual-sided and therefore pairing and matching. But if I consider from a firm perspective, the vast majority of the implementation challenge is around just getting our firm side out the door. Um, and making sure that you have trans the regulator has transparency into how we are reporting, how we are trading. So, you know, to, to the extent that the, the TR into TR rec may break, but fundamentally, your obligation to meet all the validation rules and get the data out the door remains untouched. I guess it's also worthwhile bearing in mind that we've just had this consultation around position calculations, and it's quite obvious that there'll be a reporting obligations for trade repositories to the FSB, the Financial Stability Board. And that would be a requirement for all FSB regulators. Um, so you're still going to have a more holistic global approach at that FSB level. And I'm sure that we'll see much more details of that emerge. I think it just diverts flows into cross-border in effect from being internal. I don't, don't see it's any major problem of weakening the regulation at all. Thank you. Um, so uh, moving away from Brexit a little bit. So um, James mentioned that, you know, getting the security status data in place is very important. Uh, we have a question on, you know, how are firms managing collateral stat st um, static data? They have issues like, you know, LEIs missing for some jurisdiction uh, and whether is issue or LEI have, have lapsed, for example, and there's no relationship with the issuer to get these updated. So, so what, what sort of actions or um, if anything can, can be taken here? So I think, the, I think that problem about not having a relation with the issuer as opposed to a trading counterparty which you're trying to dissolve an LAI has been one which we've talked about often. You know, I think ESMA gave us 12 months forbearance outside of Europe, um, which obviously runs out in April. I do think it's something given that the market's still relatively low in terms of the proliferation of, of LAI, issuer LAIs. I think we're going to need to figure out a strategy. I think it's likely to have to leverage a central numbering agency. It may well have to leverage particular exchanges um, to, to reach out to these parties to try and get this data point in place. Um, but, you know, as James mentioned right at the, the outset, the LA issue is one challenge amongst uh, a myriad of, of reference data problems. And, you know, I think it's really important for firms to have a front to back robust reference data management mechanism and governance policy that makes sure that you know whether it's the cfi code whether it's the LA, issued lai whether it's just counterparty lai that all of these things are, are managed monitored and controlled last ones what are some of the sftr issues for third country firms experiencing experiencing in your view i mean I, I think on this i would say i was um surprised at the number of third country branches in the eu who are reporting under SFTR, given that um, if they book their deals with their parents, they can avoid reporting. So um, that's just one observation. Um, I think one of the issues with third country firms at the moment is uh, getting themselves identified as a third country branch and therefore um, getting their, their side of reports accepted. So a lot of their counterparties are not filling in the uh, country of the other counterparty field. Um, they think they're dealing with the parent rather than the branch. I mean, legally they are, but they're dealing through the branch. So that's causing a lot of breaks. So that's one of the issues at the moment. 
Yeah, I would second that. We've had uh, a number of firms reach out that um, their trades aren't going through the reconciliation process because their other counterparties aren't listing the branch country code and it's deemed as only one party has a reporting obligation. So it is really key to make sure that you understand um, if your counterpart is a third country um, firm, if they are trading through a branch and that's updated correctly on reports. There, there are a number of optional fields which really shouldn't be treated as optional. That's one of them. And other ones like currency of collateral, um, which also need to be filled in because of the way the schema is structured. So um, this is one of the things that we do cover in the recommendations. My last question, but I guess that would be a pretty broad one, uh, would have just been uh, the lessons for you know, non-EU regulator who are still uh, under obligation from, from the FSB, um, because this is ultimately a global initiative uh, to implement some kind of um, SFT, SFT reporting as well in, in their jurisdiction. Are there any important lessons very briefly uh, that they can take from, from the experience so far? Yeah, don't do it. Uh, so Japan, for example, and America, the US have taken very different approaches. Um, the Japanese Bank of Japan has taken a sample of 50 of the largest firms, which account for 90% of their market, and they're only surveying those. And this is very much within uh, line with the FSB's idea that you're supposed to be monitor monitoring systemic risk. The US have gone a different route. They're only taking data through financial market infrastructures, so tri-party repo and CCP repo. And this, of course, um, produces uh, very accurate and very cheap information because it already exists. It provides a partial view of the market, but the US have surveyed the OTC market and um, are comfortable that they'll get to that in time. So, you know, there are other ways. Um, personally speaking, I would say SFT should be used as a test tube to see, uh, look at all the problems it's created and see if you can avoid them when you design your own system. Okay. I think that's a nice conclusion, unless anyone else with some concluding remarks? Uh, just from my perspective, I think the has been very good. I think regulators have been sort of very open to discussing some of the points and actually their feedback's been really important in helping firms establish the best way to report. Um, so I think, you know, as much engagement as can be had with different industry bodies and counterparties and infrastructure has definitely helped and would definitely be beneficial in any future regimes. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. I would definitely um, echo that and will, of course, continue to have that very uh, constructive um, dialogue. Um, okay, that brings us to the end. So thank you very much, everyone, uh, to the panelists, first of all, uh, that you joined us today. I think that was a really uh, interesting discussion. Um, and uh, thanks to, to all the participants, all the, all the uh, delegates today for joining.